we'll get started. Uh, today we have Sonara Neos, who uh, started at UCLA as an assistant professor last year. Uh, she has a strong CETA connection. She was at, at Hebrew University first, and, uh, and your MSC advisor was Mir. Yeah. Me. Postdoc and then followed up doing a PhD with Renan Barcana, which you know, is also a CETA postdoc. Uh, she used to work on boring stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now she's working on interesting things, planetary dynamics. So she's going to tell us about triplets. Thank you. So, yes, indeed, my uh, research covers a wide range of topics still, uh, from structure formation at the early universe up to the dynamics of planets and stars. And there is one thing that connects it all, which is simply physics. Uh, more specifically, gravity at different scales. And this is what I think astrophysics is all about. We're solving physics problems at astrophysical settings. And this is what I want to convey today. I'm going to focus on one system, which is the hierarchical triple system. The hierarchy here is in scale. And I'm going to explore its usefulness in understanding different astrophysical problems. I'm going to focus on retrograde hot Jupiters, and then I'm going to show you how we can use this hierarchical triple system in, an, in addressing different puzzles in astrophysics. So let's start with retrograde hot Jupiters. So hot Jupiters are Jupiter-sized planets that are found to be in a very close proximity to their host star. And by very close, I mean a day orbit. So just for comparison, our innermost planet in our own solar system, Mercury, is orbiting our, our sun once every three months. So just imagine these huge objects, uh, Jupiter objects, orbiting their star once a day. But even more puzzling is that many of these Jupiter-like planets are misaligned with respect to their stellar spin axis. So a system like this I would call a line because the planet is orbiting at the same direction as the star spins. But many of these are in fact misaligned, uh, tilted with respect to the stellar spin, ox uh, spin axis, and some are even retrograde, so orbiting to the opposite direction. And, but what is it a why is it a puzzle? Maybe this is simply the way that planets are formed and that's it. So it's actually a puzzle because of the way that we think that planets are formed. So we think that we start with a gas, clouds, the gas cloud that contracts due to its own gravity. As it contracts, it conserves angular momentum. So we're forming a star and a disk, and there is one angular momentum in the system. It means that I have most of the mass in the center, lots of the angular momentum in the disk. If I'm forming planets in the, in the disk, then all the planets should have the, the same orbital plane, all should orbit the, the star in the same direction as the star spins. And this idea works very well in our own solar system, where all the planets are orbiting our sun in the same direction as the star spins, and all of them are roughly in the same plane. And when I say roughly, I mean seven degrees. But what is seven degrees among friends when we're talking about 180 degrees? Um, so just imagine, we need to form this Jupiter-sized planet far, far, away from the, from, far away from the star where we still have lots of ice and gases. And then we need to bring it very, very close, and then we need to flip it at the same time. So this is our problem. And what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you is that if we have another, uh, another object in the system, it can do that. What it can do, it can make the system very, uh, very, in, very aligned, I'm sorry, very misaligned, inclined and even flip it. And it can also make the system very eccentric. If the system, if this star planet very, very eccentric, the planet spends a lot of time around the star and tides can help to shrink the orbit and become a hot Jupiter. Now the idea of having Another planet, another object in the system to produce hot Jupiters is certainly not new. It's been around well before us. Many people in the audience have worked on this and many people across the world have worked on this. What is new is what I'm going to show you, that our understanding of how the system works has changed very recently. And that will allow for very, very interesting behaviors for specifically retrograde hot Jupiters and many other uh, systems as well. So while I'll still have your attention, at least for now, before you'll fall asleep, I'll go to the punchline. 
So this is my punchline. I'm going to talk about hierarchical triple system in the framework of hot Jupiters. And I'm going to show you new developments that had been done to the hierarchical triple system um, uh, system. I'm going to show that these new developments have two major consequences. One is that now we can tap to larger parts of the parameter space. And I'll explain exactly what it means. And the second is that the system is far more exciting and rich than thought before. I'll show you specifically how it affects hot Jupiters. And I'm going to mention many, many different applications that we can use for triples. But basically, I can see triples everywhere. It's a problem, I admit. OK, um, another question that I want to ask before I really start is why do we care? Why do I care about hot Jupiters to begin with? Well, basically, we care about Earth, right? We care about ourselves. We want to know if there are other Earths. We're kind of selfish this way. By the way, I have the tendency of saying really silly uh, jokes. You don't have to laugh. Sometimes you can, uh, you can smile, so I'll know that you're still with me. <laughs> I'm joking. You don't have to. But, so we care about Earths. Um, that is true. And in, in, interestingly enough, observations of hot Jupiters emphasize the idea that planets don't stay put in their birthplace. They move around. And hot Jupiters uh, show the biggest migrations of them all. They change in almost two orders of magnitude, from about 5 AU to 0.02 AU. So they, seem an they show an extreme behavior, an extreme migration. So maybe if we will understand the dynamical effects that gets into m migrating uh, hot Jupiter from very far away inwards, we can understand dynamical interaction as a whole uh, for multi-systems, not just one, uh, one planet. It's a hope. OK, before I'll really, really, really start, and I'm saying this for five minutes, I want to say a few words about my collaborators. So I was lucky to have wonderful collaborators. Um, I want to mention Friend Rassio and Joram Lithwick, I'm sure you all know. Will Farr, we overlapped as postdocs at Northwestern. He is now a faculty at Birmingham, UK. I highlighted Jean Desadier here. He was an undergrad at uh, Northwestern working with us. He did extremely well. Now he is a postdoc at Oxford, UK. From the CFA group, Avi Loeb and Matt Holman, again, I'm sure they don't need any introduction. Mensa Coxis, we overlapped as, uh, as postdocs at the CFA now, is at the IIS. And I highlighted here, Gonsi Ali, amazing postdoc, she amazing student. She did very well in the postdoc uh, market this year. Um, I'm extremely proud of her. And I will probably present a few more works uh, working with Joe Silk and Dan Fabriki and so on. All right, now we really can start. So that was a very long introduction, I know. OK, exoplanets. So I want to take a minute to put exoplanet, uh, hot Jupiters in the context of exoplanets. So exoplanets observations showed us that, well, we observe exoplanets in a very large um, the variety. They vary in eccentricity, in multiplicity, in mass, in period. It's a complete zoo out there. And we have yet to observe a system like our own system. And while a lot of it may come from uh, observational biases, the mere diversity of planets inward to the orbit of Mercury is a very interesting point by itself. Now what I show you here is part of the zoo. So we have a zoo and this is only part of it. Here I'm showing the mass of the planet versus the semi-major axis ratio. And the color coding is uh, orbital eccentricity. And what I want to draw your attention is this guys. And very arbitrarily, I'm going to call everything which is almost Jupiter inward to 0.1 uh, AU, a hot Jupiter. Why? Because first I can, why not? And second, because it doesn't really matter what is the mass of these guys, at least not for what I'm going to discuss. It does matter for a lot of other different uh, um, ideas, but not exactly to what I want to talk. But the main the takeaway point here is that we have large diversity, and it seems that maybe there is this uh, separate group. And I say maybe because there are lots of other caveats for that. OK, but what do we observe? I talked about this, uh, this, this angle. This is, the, this is the spin orbit angle. We have our own, actually, expert in the audience, and Marie is there. Um, 
and I, so therefore I will not spend a lot of time explaining this. I will just say that we, when the star is uh, spinning, there is one part that receding, that's pre approaching me, one part that's receding me, so we have blue and red part. When the planet is uh, moving, like let's say like this, it first blocks the blue part, then the red part, and therefore I have a handle on this angle. Of course, I don't know the exact angle because I am missing uh, an information. I don't know exactly what is the tilt of the star. So this is the projected angle along the, st uh, along the sky. And what I've, uh, what I've plotted here is the distribution of this projected spin orbit angle. And this goes all the way up to here, approximately this bin. I just clipped it because I want us to focus more on the misaligned guys here. Uh, so we have almost 50-50, 50% in this bin, 50% of this bin, or 45, uh, 55, something like that. And I want you to look at this, these misaligned ones. They are pretty amazing, almost uniform. So I need to have, uh, I need to have a mechanism that will a to be able to produce a very, a very efficient misalignment and almost uniform. And that, that will be the task. So, as always, when we have puzzle in astrophysics, we have uh, many, many people who have many very good ideas. And very roughly, I can divide this to those that have dynamical origin and those that have some disk migration component to it. And I can even fine tune it a little bit more. In the um, dynamical origin, I can think about planet-planet scattering or perturbation by a star or a, or a planet. And I will talk about these more. Or I can either flip the star. If you think about that, the angular momentum associated with the star is much smaller than the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum. So maybe it's easier to flip the star. Or flipping the, the disk like an omelet. And, um, and then uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to overwhelm you with a bunch of names. So just to show you how, um, how, the, how, this, how this field is so, uh, 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 I lost the word. It's very, very, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, and oh, and I also want to mention, I should have mentioned it before, the, um, the University of Toronto CETA connection is always underlined. So we, before we had Emery's paper was underlined, and here we see uh, Yanchin papers and Norm's papers are underlined too. Okay, so I, am, I cannot actually give uh, the right, do any justice to all these works. So I've cherry picked two examples to talk about and I'm going to be done with that. Only two examples. So it's not fair, but you know, so is life. All right, so let's start with planet-planet scattering. So it is like it sounds. We have two planets that scatter each other like billiard balls, but instead of billiard balls, we're scattering planets. And this is an example of a result, a representative example of what happened when you do this type of experiment. Sometimes you start with three or more. And what you see here is the spin orbit angle that these guys were managed to get in the end. And you can see that there's not enough retrograde. We want very efficient retrograde formation process because we saw that it's almost uniform. So at least the spin orbit angle should not be uh, tilted toward more prograde compared to retrograde. And there are more retrograde here. All right, so this was uh, one. And another one is to flip the star. So this is based on uh, work done by Joshman back in 2010. And here what he shows, this is the spin orbit angle. It's also called uh, obliquity. As a function of the temperature of the, of the star. And what you see here, you see that those planets around cold stars marked in blue here are fairly more aligned compared to planets around, red, um, around hot stars, these are the red, that can be misaligned. And he said it's probably because of the convective envelopes. This is the main difference that hot stars have compared to cold stars. His idea was as follows. He said, well, maybe you always start out with some misalignment. For the, for the planet. Maybe you have something that will drive misalignment between a uh, planet and a, stellar, uh, and a stellar axis. Maybe the mechanism that I'm going to show you, for example. And then these misaligned planets can grab into the large convective envelopes of cold stars and tilt and uh, torque the, um, 
the, the outer shell, the outer, the outer shell of the star. And it, I do like this, so you can imagine if, if, uh, if the star is very hot, I don't have anything to grab on, so I cannot, uh, I cannot tilt it. And this is why he think that maybe this is, I can realign the, the star around cold stars and have lots of misaligned planets around uh, hot stars. Now, I will stop uh, here when I, uh, talking about other alternative models. I want to go now to hierarchical triple system. So here they are. And as I said, the hierarchy here is, is in scale. And this system was already studied back in the 60s by Kozai and Lidov. Here is a fairly recent picture of Kozai. And this is a cartoon from a Russian textbook of Lidov. And their work, very nominal, very nice work, um, showed that perturbation, gravitational perturbation from the outer, uh, from the outer orbit can cause eccentricity and inclination oscillations on the inner orbit. So the inner orbit uh, exchange eccentricity for inclination. And I'll explain this in great details in a minute. And while their work was very, uh, very interesting, it was sadly ignored for uh, many, many years until we started to observe eccentric planets, hot Jupiters, and even triple stars. And as I said before, if the planets are eccentric, maybe something can pump up its eccentricity. And hot Jupiters, of course, if it's very eccentric, it spends a lot of time. Tides can, a, a lot of time around the star, tides can work to shrink the orbit. And if I have triple stars, of course, I have uh, triple behavior. And there were some initial uh, tries to apply this mechanism, because I and of mechanism, at different scales. And while it seems very promising, it didn't quite pan out. Because it seems that you needed to start almost completely perpendicular. So the two orbits needed to be almost completely perpendicular to each other to have anything interestingly happening. So if this is it, then you know, if I need really to fine tune my initial conditions, that's not very promising. However, what I'm going to show you is that recent developments ended up showing that you don't have to have almost completely perpendicular configurations. And also that the behavior itself is very eccentric and very um, exciting. And this is basically, I'm kind of repeating my punchline here, which led to many, many applications. So if I want to talk about what I call now eccentric cosi of mechanism, I want to tell you why we started thinking about this again. And we started because, as I said, the idea of relating hot Jupiters to cosi was not new, and there are many beautiful papers that let us think again on this work. So we decided to take another look. And again, we can see the, um, the University of Toronto um, connection here. OK, so to explain what we did, first I need to define some things. So, so far, I've talked about this angle, which is the spin orbit angle. And I said retrograde whenever this angle was above 90 degrees. However, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to think, what if I have another object, right? I want to talk about uh, triple. So maybe I have another object. So the total angular momentum is not necessarily aligned with any of the stellar spin or orbital normal vector, the normal to the orbit vector. It may be misaligned. So I have here an angle between the total angular momentum and the inner orbit angular momentum. And this angle is called inclination. And I'm going to say that whenever this inclination is below 90 degrees, it's prograde. Whenever it's above 90 degrees, it's retrograde. I will talk about the spin orbit angle later, because we can add it. It's just another physical feature. I'm also going to put the z axis along the total angular momentum. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because the total angular momentum is conserved in the system. There's nothing that moves it around. So if it's conserved, it's very natural to put my z-axis along this. So whenever I say this is the z component of blah, blah, it means that this is a projection along the total angular momentum. And I'll remind you if you'll forget. All right. So here is my system. I have three body, and I want to form a, a stable configuration. One way to do it is to take two body and put this in a two body and put them in a tight configuration, and to put this guy far away. And if it's far enough, this system is stable. And we can talk later why, how much enough is enough. And what Kozai did, for example, he, uh, he did the following. He, he took the three-body Hamiltonian. 
he expanded in semi-major axis ratio. And after he did this, he actually expanded to the ratio to the power of four, which is pretty amazing doing so without Mathematica uh, to check your minuses. And, um, and after he did this, he averaged over the orbit, which means that he smashed the mass around the orbit. This is called the secular approximation. So instead of talking about three bodies, he talked about two wires interacting with each other, this wire and this wire, which means that the energy of this wire is conserved, the energy of this wire is conserved, and everything that I'm talking about comes from angular momentum exchange between these two. And then he truncated this to the lowest order of approximation, which is the semi-major axis to the power of two. And this is what he observed. He observed that the inner orbit uh, inclination is oscillating with the eccentricity. So when it's less inclined, it's more eccentric. And where it's more inclined, like this, it's less eccentric and vice versa. And there we have the 3D movie, but the 3D movie does such a crazy thing, I think it's easier to see it like that. If you really want, I can show the movie later. He also found, um, he also found uh, a conservation law. This is the, how I can write the Z component, remember, projected on the total angular momentum, the Z component of the angular momentum of the inner orbit. It's simply square root of 1 minus C square cosine I. You can see here the, uh, this exchange that I talked about. If it's less inclined, it's more, it's more eccentric. If it's more inclined, it's less eccentric. And he found that this is constant. Of course, if it's constant, it means that, uh, that I cannot, I cannot change the sign of the cosine, right? I cannot go below 90 degrees to above 90 degrees. So I cannot make things pro, uh, from prograde to retrograde. But no worries, I have not wasted your time. What I want to show you now is that this is usually not the case. All right. So we had, we started with having two, uh, two objects and we reduced them to two wires interacting with each other. I'll call this wire one, the inner one, and I'll call this wire two. So I basically have now two, uh, two Kepler problems. In Kepler problems, I have six, param six parameters. They're not sick. <laughs> and I can think about them as x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z. Now, to simplify things, I will talk about three, uh, three angles and three angular momenta, because I want to talk about angular momenta at the end. So we, all we need to do is count to, uh, to 12. We're going to count to, to 12 parameters. And then we're going to add two vectors and, and see what we get. And what I'm going to tell you already is that we're going to get that the z component of the angular momentum is not conserved. So let's start by thinking about the angles. Now, if you have never thought about these angles before, that is fine. The first time I encountered this, I didn't think about these angles as well. They're funny angles, and I'll explain exactly what they are. So the first angle is simply, it's called the mean anomaly. People like to write this as m for the inner one, outer two. And this angle tells me where the object is in its orbit. So since I'm going to average over these, um, over the orbits, I'm going to eliminate these angles from the system. So they will no longer uh, uh, annoy us. The co so remember, this is a Hamiltonian formalism, so for every parameter, for every variable, every coordinate, have the conject, the, con, the conject, conjugate. thank you, the conjugate momentum, thanks. Here I'll have the conjugate, conjugate angular momentum, which I'll write as, here it's gra the gravitational constant, semi major axis of the inner and outer orbit, and the, con uh, the reduced mass of the inner and outer orbit. So already I have four parameters that I'm done with from the 12. Since I'm uh, averaging over this, that means that this is constant. Because in the Hamiltonian formalism, if I don't see the angle, that means that the conjugate momentum is constant. This is because to get if it's conserved or not, uh, I just do dh the parameter to get to p dot. All right, so that is it. So we're done from this. The second angle is called the argument of periaps. Now, for the inner and outer orbit, this is simply an angle in the plane of the ellipse. Imagine that I'm an ellipse. Uh, that tells me where the ellipse points at. 
And since I'm doing this little dance, I hope that by doing this dance, you can imagine that the conjugate momentum is actually the angular momentum. This dance, like a ballerina. I'm not a ballerina, I know. So I have here the angular momentum of the inner and outer orbit, which I can write as square root of minus e of the inner and outer orbit square. This makes sense because if I have a very eccentric orbit, it has very little angular momentum. All right. The last angle that we need is called the longitude of ascending nodes of the inner and outer orbit. So I'm going to do a, another a little dance. So here is the ellipse. And now imagine that this ellipse is tilted with respect to, the, to, uh, to an arbitrary plane, let's say with respect to the floor. So this is what this angle tells me, how this, how this ellipse is tilted. And since I do this tilt, I hope that uh, you can imagine that the conjugate momentum is the z component of the angular momentum. And I know my dances are not so good, so it, it's fine if you, it's hard to see. And I'll write it down, and then I'll draw something. So here it is with cosine i 1 and 2. Let's think for a minute on the vectors. This is l tot. This is l1. It's the angular momentum of the inner orbit. This is the angular momentum of the outer orbit. I draw this, uh, this vector larger just because the angular momentum of the outer orbit has more angular momentum. Imagine that this produced the L tot. This is I1. This is I2. So you can see that the z component of the angular momentum, remember this is along the z axis, is simply that. OK, let's add the vectors here. This is very straightforward to do. Here is adding the vectors. I'm going just to uh, rearrange this for a minute. So I have L2 is equal to L tot minus L1. I just moved this L1 over here. I'm going to take the square of this. L2 square is equal to L tot square plus L1 square minus 2 L tot L1 cos i i1. This is again the z component of the inner orbit. Remember, this is what cos i said at its constant. In fact, if we're thinking about what cos i said, so cos i had uh, three body Hamiltonian, he expanded it and, uh, and left only the quadrupole approximation, the lowest order of approximation. And he found that this Hamiltonian depends only on one angle, which is omega 1. All right, so now let's do the trick. Our trick is if we see the variable, then it's varying with time. If not, then it's constant. This is the Hamiltonian formalism. So let's mark here on this, on this um, equation what is constant. So first of all, we find that the angular momentum of the outer orbit is constant. This is a very interesting feature. It's a feature of the, of the approximation, the quadrupole approximation. And it means that in the quadrupole approximation, the outer orbit, the inner orbit, sees the outer orbit as if it's um, axisymmetric. So there is a symmetry here for rotation of the outer orbit. What does it mean for us? Actually, nothing. All we need to do, all we need to care is just think that maybe we work in an axisymmetric potential. So my eccentricity, the outer orbit eccentricity is zero. This also means that there is a problem, an inherent problem with a quadrupole approximation because it can work only if my outer orbit is axisymmetric. And this will play a very important role later. We also see that the total angular momentum is conserved, right? There's nothing here that, that destroyed the total angular momentum. Um, also, we don't see here big omega 1. So this also means that this conserved. This is quasi integral of motion. And here is the problem, as you can see it. I have something which varying with time. Right, this is the conjugate of omega 1. And everything else is constant with time. So that is the main problem that arises in the nominal quasi um, calculation. And it comes because they forgot something. They forgot this big omega 1 minus omega 2. These are the uh, longitude of ascending nodes. If I have total angular momentum conservation in the system, they are equal to pi which is nice, and it's OK. But I cannot put this back in the Hamiltonian. So the only reason that I know that it's equal to pi is, actually, there are two reasons. Either I'm a physicist, 
And I figured out that I have a spherical symmetry in the system, and therefore this longitude of ascending nodes difference is pi. Or that I solved the Hamiltonian. I found that it depends on omega 1 minus omega 2. And I found that it's always pi in my frame of reference. And then I plugged it in. Either way, I cannot plug in something that I knew before into the Hamiltonian formalism. This is not allowed. It's very, not very, but it's similar of doing df dx of x at x equal 2. Of course, it's not equal of df of x equal to dx. Now, this is not, uh, this is not as easy a problem as this. This is, uh, this behavior is called, uh, this behavior was acceptable in many, many different, um, many, many different solar system dynamics, dynamics uh, problems. It even has a name, the elimination of the nodes. But we just need to be careful when we do that. All right. So I think I convinced you. Or not. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, a, this is the trick. Saying, yeah. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> Thank you. That is the real challenge. Uh, I think I'm convinced you that this is only conserved. In one, this is usually not conserved, and it's only conserved in one specific uh, case. Only if I have axisymmetric potential around me and a test particle in the inner orbit. Only then I have conservation of the z component of the angular momentum. It just does like that. All right, so what did we do? First of all, we allowed, we re-derived this. We allowed for the z component of the angular momentum of the inner and outer orbit to vary. We also expanded everything to the octopole level of approximation. Now, uh, the octopole level of approximation, this has already been done before us. It was done correctly. Just everything that I'm going to show you was simply missed. Um, and the reason that we expand to the octopole is because, as I said, the quadrupole is only applicable if I have uh, axisymmetric potential. So I didn't like the, uh, the quadrupole so much. And what it means, basically, it means that I can tap now to larger parts of the parameter. I'm no longer confined to really almost 90. And I'll show you, I'll show you different things. And it also means that if I start from below 90 degrees, I can go above 90 degrees. So saying that I can doesn't mean exactly that I can. So let's try to flip a planet, if you wish. So does this remotely close hypothetical? Yes. <laughs> yeah, or well, you asked exactly in the time of the joke. Um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> um, so this is an excellent question. I actually have many slides on this. Can you ask me again in the end? I'll remind you if you forget. Um, <laughs> That's called leading the witness. Yes, I know. That is fine. It's not a trial. At least I don't think it's a trial. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so there's one way to flip a planet. I'm repeating my joke. No, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> this is another. Um, so what I'm showing here is an example. Here is the inclination. 1 minus e. So this is circular. This is eccentric. And that's just to hammer a point, the point. This is the z component of the inner and, or and outer angular momentum as a function of time. You can see here, just as because I said, we have eccentricity and inclination um, modulation, but here from prograde to retrograde, prograde and retrograde and vice versa. And even to hammer more the point, this is what happens if you do the nominal quadruple cosi. It's the blue curve. So you can see that there is a qualitative difference in the way that the system behaves from the blue to the red. It's completely different. You can also see that the eccentricity is pretty large. So here is another example. What I want to show in this example are two things. First, it is hard to decide what is, uh, what is this envelope of the octopole. So these little ones are the quadruple, the lowest order of approximation. The big modulation comes from the octopole. And it's hard to say what is the time scale of this envelope. Is it this one or is it this one? And, um, and this is because many times this, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, wait, because many times uh, our behavior now is chaotic. Yes. Oh, yeah, in the previous slide, it says GR effect includes some periods where GR is important. 
So it's important sometimes. Actually, here they are not important at all. It only uh, it's important. It make a contribution if my two masses are the same. So there are for the octopole level of approximation, um, the prefactor that comes before the um, the Hamiltonian. It depends on actually the mass of the inner and outer orbit. I'm sorry, the mass of the two inner orbits, m1 and m2, and the difference between them. So if they're exactly the same, the octopole, all these cool stuff, the flips and the very high eccentricity dies. But if I add a gr, the gr effects adds uh, uh, another level of asymmetry. It actually adds more uh, resonance, higher order resonances, that reintroduce, re-trigger this behavior. So in, in what I showed before, it does not, but the, in a general way, it does. Yes? So I'm just trying to understand what's going on. The semi-major axis ratio. So the, as, a, as the separation actually larger and larger, it works even better and better because we go with a... Actually, I'm saying a, a little bit of a different thing. I'm saying let's start with hierarchical uh, approximation that we both like. So it's very, the, the, ex, the multiple expansion is valid. But I'm saying that if our, your outer perturber is not axis symmetric, if it's eccentric, for example, then you need also to go to the higher or the higher uh, multiple, to the octopole. I'm saying I'm saying that it's only right. I'm trying to uh, let's let's phrase it positively. It's only right if your outer orbit is axis symmetric. So if I have a circular outer orbit, then it's okay to use the. Um, then it's okay if this is hierarchical enough to use the quadrupole approximation. Question how close the oh. oh, this is this is an excellent question. If this is the an, if this is the question, then my answer is that the prefactor. Let's ignore the masses. So let's uh, have a ma uh, um, test particle for a second. The prefactor is proportional to what I call epsilon. It's semi-major axis ratio, eccentricity of the outer orbit minus eccentricity square. What I've written here, if this is my Hamiltonian, I have here all the other energy. This is quadrupole plus epsilon octopole. So this is proportional to A1 over A2 to the square, together with the epsilon, A1 to the A2 to the power of 3. So this is actually something that I did with Yoram. We showed that if this is smaller than 0.1, it's roughly OK. So when you go to larger and larger, um, when you violate this epsilon, then most of the time um, the octopole already is not enough. You either need to go to higher multiples or you just need to do an n body. In fact, there were other studies that showed that if you want, and many of them actually done, uh, some of them done by here, by Fabio Antonini, who talked about um, the difference in the, in the angular momentum. So I checked this compared to epsilon. They have very similar uh, behavior, um, uh, very similar um, uh, functional form uh, in a way, because they both depend basically on the angular momentum of the outer orbit, which is here, 1 minus e squared. So uh, this, is, this is another way to look at this. That answers both your questions? Well, I guess I was saying that if the octopole, if the, if the orbits have low eccentricity, then the octopole Less important, less yeah. But if the eccentricity times the semi-major axis in the outer orbit becomes comparable with the spacing of the outer and inner orbit, then the outer pole will be as important as the quadrant. Yes, that's true. Yep. OK, so oh, well, I've been taking my time. Um, what I want to, so I want to mention a few, few more things. Um, so we see here these eccentricity spikes. 
So the eccentricity can become very, very large. This was the work of a few of my students. Uh, Gonzi Ali, I've mentioned her. Jean de Sadia, I've mentioned him. Oh, I, I forgot to mention Ian uh, Lizaraga. He was an undergrad working with us for a short time at Northwestern. He's now doing a PhD at Cornell. He actually left astrophysics. Would you believe that? So just, uh, I, I don't think I had anything to do with it. At least I hope. Um, what, what, the, uh, what they found is they found that the eccentricity can become extremely high in many, many cases. I'm summing up a lot of work in a few sentences. And, they, and the punchline, just to overwhelm, is that we can even go to about 0.999999 uh, of 1 minus eccentricity. So we can get extremely close. But of course, what happens if I go very, very close to a star? Tides should work. So let's add tides. So here I'm adding tides. So I'm showing, showing here an example of inclination, 1 minus eccentricity. Again, 1 minus eccentricity, I probably didn't, I forgot to say it. We care about this because we care about the pericenter passage. This is where tides uh, uh, play a role. And this is a zoom in of the last 1, 2, 3, 4 cosi oscillations. And we can see that there were these oscillations. Again, red is the, with, uh, up to the octopole, and green is up to the quadrupole. And here in the zoom in, we can see that there were two final, um, uh, two final pericenter passages before something happened. To know what happened, let's look at the semi-major axis here. This is of the inner orbit, outer orbit, and pericenter and apocenter behaviors. And here we can see first pericenter passage, we had a drop here. And then in the second pericenter passage, there was a full drop tides really shrank this. It seems like it goes to zero because this is a linear scale. However, it went to 0 .0, uh, it 0 0.02 AU. So it went all the way to 0 0.02 AU. I formed the hot Jupiter. This is where it becomes stable. I formed the hot Jupiter retrograde in terms of uh, inclination. But now remember, what we actually observe is the spin orbit angle. So here's the spin orbit angle. We can add this. It's very simple. It's just a top on top of a top. So we know how to, how to solve this. And we see that not only we solved it, we have an inclination, um, a hot Jupiter retrograde in inclination. It's also retrograde in terms of, um, uh, in terms of spin orbit angle. Now showing one example is not good. I actually need to prove this more statistically. So what should we do? I would, uh, this is also just to make the point of all the evolution, we don't need. I would like to, uh, to think about an, a planet as a perturber. But this is a hard thing to do because we don't know exactly what is the distribution of planets, uh, of, of outer planets. But we do know what's the distribution of outer, um, outer stars. We have binary stars distribution coming from observations. So let's use that. Let's assume that we have only one planet in the system. The star is at 5 AU. Let's assume that it starts completely aligned with a, with a star in terms of spin orbit. So let's assume that it formed in situ inside the, inside the disk and it was aligned initially. And about the inclination of the stars, we can assume an isotropic inclination, although it also works if I only take the prograde part. It, it doesn't change the, the behavior. Also, it doesn't change the behavior if my star is not very massive, if I just put something else. It's just a matter of the time scale. And let's try to see what we get. So this type of exercise was already done before us by Yan Xin and by, um, uh, and by others. And what we, and by Dan and Scott, and what I show here is their, uh, is their work. And what you see here, this is, um, this is using, using what I call the test particle quadrupole. And I find these works amazing because you can see here that they predict retrograde hot Jupiters before anyone had ever observed retrograde hot Jupiters to begin with. And I always find that this is uh, very rare in astrophysics these days that we predict something and then we observe it. This is pretty amazing, I think. So they predict the, the behavior of retrograde hot Jupiters, uh, which is great. And now you can also see that, uh, that the difference uh, was a little bit, that uh, it doesn't have enough retrograde. Uh, but now let's try to do this again, but with the new developments. And the different lines here correspond to different types of initial conditions, different tides, whatnot. I don't like fudge factors, so I played with the tides. Um, eccentricities, there, some people say that the eccentricity of, uh, 
of the stars is uniform, some say it's thermal, it doesn't matter. You can see that I have almost a uniform distribution. This is nice, but this is again, this is the actual spin orbit axis uh, angle. What we observe is the projected one. So let's project it. So here it is. Um, what I'm showing here, this is the, the distribution versus the projected spin orbit angle. Here I show the observations in, in black. I'm showing in green what I showed you before, just projected. And I'm showing in red, uh, I've projected the planet planet scattering uh, experiment that people had done before. And we did a Bayesian analysis and we asked the question, giving the entire fraction of hot Jupiters, how many of them are consistent with forming from, uh, from cosine stellar binaries, eccentric cosine stellar binaries? The answer was 30%, which, uh, which the reason that it happened is because we cannot produce all of this. And that was kind of disappointing, but then we say, okay, you know what, maybe we need to think about all the misaligned ones. So looking at only the misaligned ones, we say between 60 and 80 percent uh, of the misaligned systems. Um, there are some connections here to, uh, um, to Toronto again. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't like this result. It, it sounds to me very 50-50. It means to me that we still don't know a lot. So while it's nice and I can wave my hands and say, oh, eccentric cosi, retrograde, hot Jupiters, I don't like this because it means that we don't really understand what's going on. But I still enjoyed doing that. And um, in fact, it, leads, it leads to a confession that I want to say. So I have a, no, that's the wrong one. Yes, of course. So that I just assume that the inclination is isotropic in distribution. If the system is what? If, if the system is not that bad, it's kind of compact. Oh, excellent, excellent question. So uh, what Yanshin is asking, does it make sense if I have very close by stars that something will happen? In fact, what happened if, is I, first of all, most probably if the, if the stars are very close, it's not fair to assume that they have an isotropic distribution. And second, if they do have some inclination, as, uh, as I assumed, therefore what happened is that the, the planet is basically killed. So the planet will be driven toward the star. So this high eccentricity is being generated so fast that tides cannot respond. So if I want to think about the, the fraction of stars, of systems from everything that I've shown you that can make a hot Jupiter as a function of the semi-major axis, and let's put here uh, 100 and let's put here uh, 1500, it does something like this, and this is approximately, actually, does something like this. This is about 700 or 800, if I remember correctly, and this is about 15 percent. 15 percent approximately here, and then they die. So completely correct. So most are contributing from a very, very far away uh, companions. So the contribution for the Semi-major axis, I'm sorry, the contribution for hot Jupiters come mainly from very far away companions. It is because it's eccentric. They can be eccentric as, as they like. And the octopole is still important, even for, even, even if you, so I take 0.3 and semi-major axis A1 over A2, it does. I can, I can show you later if you like what happened if I look at stars. Uh, just triple stars. I can go all the way. Uh, the octopole makes a big difference if and if I can go all the way to 10 to the 4 semi-major axis uh, in uh, AU in semi-major axis. Okay, I want to make a confession to end. Uh, my confession is that recently I've been really seeing triples everywhere. And triples are very important. You know, you, they can take you all the way to the moon if you want. Uh, in fact, I've seen triples also in astrophysical uh, 
uh, systems and not just everywhere. Um, and we talked about planetary systems. So I mentioned, of course, oh, uh, so uh, oh, blah, 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 let's start again. Uh, there were actually many interesting uh, works that studied uh, triples in our own solar system. You can think about binary, um, binary minor planets in this, uh, in this state, and you'll, have, um, and you'll have a natural triple. In fact, we need to remember that everything that I showed you today is simply approximation. It's not, it's not enough thinking about this. So every derivative, every test particle, can, uh, we can gain understanding about its behavior through the triples again. I talked about uh, hot Jupiters. And yeah, I said that. And of course, we can also think about triple stars, for example. Triple stars has been around for a long time. Uh, if I have triples, I added this connection just because they're visiting. Uh, <laughs> uh, I added this. Uh, so if we think about, um, so this is why it's underlined. So if we think about triple stars, of course, the triple should be there. And one of the interesting things is that they can form blue stragglers. In, in our opinion, if you'll have, uh, if you'll have if, you'll, if you can excite the eccentricity very much, you can form blue stragglers. And we saw that that has a very big effect on blue, blue stragglers. Um, and I'll be more than happy to talk about that in one point. It's also important for X-ray binaries. This had, uh, 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 had got a lot of emphasis uh, here, for example, at least two papers, if not more. And also, uh, very popular these days, it's type 1A supernova. And again, a lot of, again, a lot of contribution for, uh, from CETA. And of course, triple, star, uh, triple black holes, or any black hole system. For example, if I just have two uh, black holes, I can think about tidal disruption event that will, uh, that will do something to it. Fabio is not here anymore, but he worked a lot about this. For me, it was extremely exciting. It meant that I was in a in an observer, observational paper, we think that G2, the famous uh, gas cloud in the center of the galaxy, we think it's actually binary that merged due to COSI. So it's, uh, it's very exciting, uh, very nice. Uh, of course, if you have triple black holes, then you'll have uh, the COSI effect. So I can sum up, I think, here by reminding you my punchline. So uh, in the hierarchical triple system, I showed you that there were new developments that led to many uh, new exciting behaviors. And we can tap now to larger parts of the parameter space. And I hope they show you that this can be applied. I'm not really going crazy seeing triples everywhere. It is very applicable. But we need to be careful. It's just an approximation. OK, that's it. Thank you. So uh, I just want to see if I understood your question. You're asking me if I had any assumption on the inclination distribution? No, no. Okay. Were you truncating the um, potential of the particle or were you uh, including doing the full orbital integration? Oh, so I, the way that I'm doing this, I just I don't have any assumptions on the inclination to begin with. The only thing that we're doing is a multiple expansion in the semi-major axis ratio, and that's it. And then we average over the orbit. So there is no, the, usually when people think about the secular is what we find in, uh, in Moore and Dermont. They have the small eccentricity and small inclination. This is not the case here. Inclination and eccentricity can be whatever they want. But he's asking you were doing direct end body integration. Oh, not direct end body. But we compared it to direct end body, and it works. Well, I guess that was, yeah, how well does it work? Oh, actually, pretty well. Here is an example. There's one example. I bit this to death. There's another entire paper where every time I put one of these plots, I also compare this to n body. So you can see that there, I think I kept the notation here, red is my calculation and blue is the n body. And this is just one example. Yeah. So, so I, oh, sorry. I think looking at your plots has answered my question. The cosine critical angle is still there. Uh, actually, uh, no. 
No. Uh, this is very beautiful work done by, uh, done by Gunzi Eli, so I'm very happy that you asked. Let's start by talking about resonances. I'll, I'll fly through this very, very quickly. Um, I want to talk about resonances. What better way to talk about resonance, resonances by talking about the pendulum? So if I have a pendulum and I start uh, uh, with, some, with some angle, I can plot the momentum and the theta like this, right? And then I can start with a larger angle, an even larger angle, and I'm, try I'm really not trying to hypnotize you here. And then even if with a larger angle I have more energy, I have a different type of behavior. And if I plot all these behaviors together, I find that there are two trajectories, basically. What we call liberation, what we call uh, rotation or circularization. And in the middle, there is something that separates them. It's the separatrix, and this is the resonance. And now the question is, what's happening for the cosi? So for the cosi, it's very simple to think again about uh, resonances in this case. It's just a very complicated double pendulum. So in double pendulum, if you've ever seen that, it's really, really cool. It does all kind of crazy stuff. Now, unlike double pendulum here, the coefficient before the angles are not constant. So it's a little bit more complicated. But you can imagine if I have two uh, resonances and they are overlapping each other, these two eyes are overlapping each other, then basically you don't know where to go, here or here. And it produces chaos many times. So this is what Gonsia has shown. We call this, uh, it's called a surface of, a, uh, surface of section. This is how you see, so this is for a test particle, so you have two degrees of freedom. So you reduce, this is the actual behavior, and you reduce this onto one surface. So you can see the, these are the resonances, the quadruple level of resonances. But then we have higher level of resonances. These are those ones. This is, uh, uh, the, come from the octopole. The chaos that you see here comes from overlapping. So there's an interaction between the quadrupole and the, and the octopole. What does it mean? Now let's, let's just work in a, in a, in a system where the, um, where the quadrupole resonances do, do not matter. So let's start with something which is, Oops. Let's start with something which is very, uh, very almost coplanar. So I start here. This is uh, what Goncia has started. This is five uh, inclination of, of five degrees. Very eccentric. So the both are very eccentric. The octopole is very important. Quadrupole dead. So there's no resonance in the quadrupole. The 40 and 140 comes for resonance in the quadrupole, and and then beyond you don't have it. But you have the three resonances in the octopole that accumulate. You can flip up and down and up and down. And this, to answer the anticipating question, we also uh, confirmed with anybody. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Why should, why should, why should the hot triggers be especially vulnerable? Probably they're not. So <laughs> I don't know if they are. If, they are only, if there's only one Jupiter in the system, then probably there is something. So if I have another body, so I can imagine this. But if I have multi-planet system that are all tied together, just like our own system, this will not happen because this, uh, the cosine mechanism will be suppressed by the, um, uh, by the coupling between the different planets. So I don't know if they're really vulnerable to it. Some say that if you form, uh, if you form soon to be hot Jupiter, maybe it formed by itself. Some say no, you form them in a bunch, like planet planet scattering. Some say we don't know. I'm in the I'm in the middle. I have no idea. I don't know if there are. Are you seeing other planets that are also retrograde? So far, no. There's only one observation. American. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so so tired. American can answer this better than me. Uh, we have, I think, one. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Ro uh, Russell Turner McLaughlin for non-Jupiter. So I think uh, we probably should stop here and there's cookies upstairs for people who want to ask questions. Okay. So let's thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks.